Hello everyone, welcome back to Classical Archaeology. In this video, we're going to discuss the transition from small settlements to the first cities in the ancient Near East that came in the wake of the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution. We're also going to discuss what it means to be classical as well, since this course is titled Classical Archaeology. First, let's discuss what it means to be classical. The Oxford English Dictionary uses two definitions for the term classical. The first is of, relating to, or characteristic of Greek or Roman antiquity. The second definition comes from the Latin word classicus, which means representative or exemplary of a class of things. We're going to use the first definition in this course, as the main focus of this class is the exploration of the Greek and Roman civilizations through the study of their archaeological remains. The second definition is also useful and relevant to us, as many elements of so-called Western and United States culture have used Greco-Roman civilizations as an example and a guide. Some examples can be found on this slide. The Jefferson Memorial in Washington, DC, like most other United States monumental architecture, is built in a neoclassical style. Note its dome and its columns and its pediment. Also note this statue of George Washington wearing a toga. Washington never would have worn a toga during his life, but because of the fascination that Americans have had with the classical civilizations, they've depicted the father of our country wearing ancient Roman garb. In order to better understand ancient Greek and ancient Roman cities, we have to discuss the origins of cities and specifically how cities developed from the first sedentary agricultural settlements that emerged in the ancient Near East, roughly 11 to 12,000 years ago. This map shows the two important regions in the ancient Near East that we're going to be discussing throughout this video. Anatolia, including part of what is now Turkey, as well as Mesopotamia, including what is now Iraq, as well as parts of the Levant as well. Specifically, within these two regions, we're going to discuss the settlement of Jericho and the settlement of Chateau Huyuk. Jericho was in Mesopotamia, in the Levantine region, and Chateau Huyuk was in Anatolia. Before moving forward, I wanted to give a couple of comments about the dates that I'm going to be using in this lecture and throughout the course. First, I want to say that students of all faiths, spiritualities, and beliefs are welcome in this course. The dates presented in this course, however, may not line up with those presented by some religious texts. This course is not trying to invalidate the contents of these religious texts or the beliefs of the students enrolled in this course. Regarding dates, this course will present the academic consensus arrived at through a variety of relative and absolute dating methods, all of which have limitations. We discussed some of those limitations in a previous lecture. As such, not all scholars agree on these dates, and these dates may be changed in light of new discoveries. What I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to force any one specific belief on any student. I'm merely presenting what scholars and scientists have found so far. And their findings may change in the future based on new discoveries. Also, before continuing on, I want to revisit V. Gordon Child's 10 criteria for ancient cities. Um, Child developed these criteria in 
1950, discussing the development of urban centers in the ancient Near East. Subsequent scholars have argued that Child's criteria may not fit as well for cities outside of the ancient Near East, such as places like the Americas. However, I think that Child's criteria are very useful in discussing ancient Near Eastern and ancient Mediterranean cities, and therefore we'll be using them in this lecture and throughout the course. The first of Child's criteria for ancient cities is that a settlement, in order to be considered a city, it must have concentrations of a relatively large number of people in a restrictive area. Second, this settlement must have developed social stratification. Third, although most of the citizens of the settlement would have been farmers or involved in some kind of agricultural labor, some pursued non-agricultural occupations, craft specialists, priests, traders, administers, administrators, warriors, etc. Four, the production of an economic surplus and its appropriation by a central authority, such as a king or a deity, must take place. Fifth, the settlement must use writing to record economic activity as well as the myths, events, and other ideological issues that serve to justify the discrepancies between the privileged and lower classes of the settlement. Exact and predictive sciences, six, must be used as well. These sciences must be used to forecast the weather, since knowing the weather is essential for successful agricultural production. The seventh thing a center must have to be considered a city is monumental public architecture, which would include things like temples, palaces, fortifications, and tombs. Eight, to be considered a city, a center must have figural art. Nine, the city must be involved in foreign trade. And then 10, the people living in a center must have residence-based group membership in which people of all classes could share in a sense of community, the community of the city. What you're going to see is that a couple of the settlements we're discussing in this video, Jericho and Chateau Hoyok have many of these criteria but neither of them have all 10. So for the purpose of this course, Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk will not be considered cities. However, some of the settlements we're going to discuss later in the lecture, like Uruk, had all 10 of these criterion. Therefore, they will be considered cities. While Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk cannot be considered cities by the criteria we listed previously. They were civilizations. What does it mean to be living in a civilization? Rather, what does it mean to be civilized? When most people hear the term civilized or civilization, they think of a very advanced state of living, a state of living that includes significant amounts of technology. Someone might say, after a long trip in the wilderness, returning home, Thank goodness I've returned to civilization. They may even say this after something as simple as losing cell phone service. I've come back to civilization now that I have cellular service. Scholars and scientists, however, have a slightly different definition of civilization. They define civilization as the state or condition of being civilized human cultural, social, and intellectual development that is considered to be of an advanced or a progressive nature. In other words, there must be technological development that must be advancing at a significant rate. A, a settlement cannot be considered a civilization if it is stagnant. The settlements of Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk while not possessing all of child's requirements for cities, certainly possessed the requirements to be considered civilizations. As there was advancing cultural, social, intellectual development in these centers. 
I will give evidence of that advancement in the subsequent slides. On another note, I want to discuss the materials used to build these settlements. These settlements were usually built from mud and straw bricks. These bricks are highly decomposable. They break apart over time as a result of the weather and human use. As these buildings would disintegrate, new ones would be built on top of the ruins, creating artificial hills, which we call tells or hoyuks. I mentioned tells or hoyuks briefly in a previous video. The breakdown of these buildings will also create layers of strata, which can be investigated by archaeologists. Before beginning our discussion of Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk, we should briefly outline why the humans of the ancient Near East adopted sedentary agriculture. Scientists and scholars believe that the Neolithic agricultural revolution occurred around the year 10,000 BCE, 12,000 years ago, or about a thousand years before Jericho emerged as a settlement. They think that a change in the world climate as a result of the end of the last great ice age made the ancient Near East far wetter and more humid than it is today. The inhabitants of the ancient Near East would have noticed an abundance of grasses and flora that could be eaten. Over time, these people would have selectively bred these plants to create the grains and vegetables that we know today. Examples include barley, lentils, and wheat. These people also would have domesticated animals, starting with smaller animals like sheep and eventually working their way up to larger creatures like cattle. These animals provided meat, dairy products, skins and wool, and power as beasts of burden. By the way, horses would not be brought to the ancient Near East until about 2500 BCE. Horses are native to Central Asia, much further to the north. Adoption of agriculture and animal husbandry would have provided more food security than a semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle. It also would have allowed for the increased division of labor thanks to resource surpluses, as an entire community would not have to be involved in food acquisition and production some members of that community could become artisans or administrators or warriors. At the same time, in gaining extra security, people transitioning from hunter-gatherer to sedentary agricultural life would have also lost many freedoms, as social hierarchies and governments emerged to manage the resource surpluses. People had to submit to the hegemony of their rulers, and they had to prepare for warfare against other settlements that wanted to seize their resources. While rapid starvation was less likely in sedentary agricultural societies, there is evidence that people in agricultural societies suffer from other maladies. Everyday people often suffer from malnutrition due to their unbalanced grain-based diet. Physically inactive rulers who ate more varied diets instead dealt with diseases like gout, caused by excessive meat consumption. The settlement of Jericho was first established roughly around 9000 BCE, and the area has been continuously inhabited by humans ever since. Here's a reconstructed overlay of what the settlement of Jericho would have looked like. As you can see, there's modern agricultural fields all across the site. You will also notice that the settlement of Jericho had multiple levels, and it also contained walls as well. These multiple levels reflect the multiple tells or layers of strata, once again, highlighting the site's continuous human occupation. The settlement was probably destroyed and rebuilt many times, 
as noted by religious stories. The walls, shown in this reconstruction, were most likely built for defense, but they may have also been built for flood control as well, to protect the settlement from being washed away by the nearby Jordan River. As you can see, the houses were detached from one another. Initially, they were round in shape, but gradually were replaced by quadrangles, demonstrating increased architectural sophistication, a core sign of civilization. Residents of Jericho also made artwork and practiced basic metallurgy, although they still relied mostly on stone tools. Some domiciles were larger and more ornate than others, suggesting a degree of social stratification and that this settlement would have had rulers of some kind. One of the elements of child's parameters for cities. Jericho, however, is still too small to be considered a city. As such, it is a civilization and a large settlement, but not truly a city. Here are some reconstructions of what the walls of Jericho may have looked like. As you can see, these walls were designed primarily to keep out enemy military forces. The residents of Jericho may have also dug moats around the walls. These moats probably did not contain water most of the year due to the climate's aridity but they would have made scaling the walls more difficult. Now we can talk a little bit more about the buildings of Jericho and how they were used by Jericho's residents. The houses of Jericho were built closely together, but they became more sophisticated with time. The materials the people of Jericho used included mud brick, roofs, made of palm fronds and thatch, as well as paints and pigments like whitewash to make their houses colorful. The people of Jericho also would have kept food in their homes, including grains they had harvested, as well as their livestock, primarily sheep and goats. Swine and cattle would not be domesticated until later. Keeping their food and their livestock in the settlement would have kept these valuable items safe from theft. The settlement of Jericho was founded without pottery and metallurgy, although these technologies would be adopted later. Because of the resource surpluses, people of Jericho experienced, they had time to dedicate towards artwork, like some of the figures shown in this slide. These are figures the people of Jericho made to represent themselves. They also collected the skulls of the dead, decorated them with seashells, and kept them in the floors of their home. The seashells showed that Jericho, an inland city, had trade networks with the coast. The Jericho residents may have also decorated the bones of the deceased as a form of ancestor worship and to signify ownership on the lands which they practiced agriculture. This is a common trend we see in many early agricultural societies as they worked to justify their ownership of land, and their agricultural activities. The Jericho residents' attitude towards human remains stand in stark contrast to how the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome viewed human remains thousands of years later. Greco-Roman people believed that dead bodies should be kept away from living spaces it should either be cremated or buried in cemeteries and necropolises separated from where people lived. Now, let's discuss Chateau Hoyuk. Chateau Hoyuk 
was inhabited from roughly 6500 to 5500 BCE. Unlike Jericho, the settlement of Chateau Hoyuk was eventually abandoned. Chateau Hoyuk was built in a geographically diverse region near plains, river valleys, and mountains, all of which would have offered a variety of resources to Chateau Hoyuk's residents. Some scholars think that the residents of Chateau Hoyuk may have been the first people to domesticate cattle. The people of Chateau Hoyuk had resource surpluses, giving them a chance to make art, woven cloth, and jewelry. Like the residents of Jericho, they also placed the bones of the dead in their homes, possibly for the same reasons of ancestor worship and signifying their ownership of the land on which the settlement was built. The people of Chateau Hoyuk used a variety of materials in their artwork, suggesting they had extensive trade routes. They used seashells from the Mediterranean and they used minerals from the Sinai Peninsula. In their artwork, the residents of Chateau Hoyuk also practiced basic metallurgy, but like the residents of Jericho, they still relied primarily on stone tools. Unlike the residents of Jericho, the people of Chateau Hoyuk built their homes attached to one another. They would enter their homes through the roof. Their houses were not separated like those in Jericho. Also, unlike Jericho, Chateau Hoyuk did not possess walls. The architecture of Chateau Hoyuk actually bears some similarities to the Pueblo style of architecture used by the indigenous people of the North American Southwest. For some reason, the settlement of Chateau Hoyuk was abandoned around the year 5500 BCE. Scientists and scholars do not agree exactly on why the settlement was abandoned, although some think that a natural disaster, possibly a volcano, may have caused the, cit the citizens of Chateau Hoyuk to abandon their homes. Here is an image of daily life in Chateau Hoyuk. As you can see, the residents of the settlement enter their homes through holes in the roof, and they traverse the roofs using ladders. You can see the similarity between Chateauhuyuk's architecture and the architecture used by some Native American peoples in the North American Southwest. Like the people of Jericho, the residents of Chateau Hoyuk decorated their homes with art. They used white plaster and red paint to make their homes look especially vibrant. On the right is a recreation of what a home in Chateau Hoyuk would have looked like when it was inhabited. As you can see, there's artwork on the wall, there's a cow skin, on this bench, and there's even horns on the wall, suggesting that the residents of this home may have worshipped cattle, since cattle were an important part of their livelihoods. Scholars think that the image depicted on this wall, and again on the left side of this slide, is a volcano erupting, a clue to why the settlement may have been abandoned. Now that we've discussed some of the early agricultural settlements, Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk, we can discuss the development of the first cities in the ancient Near East. The first cities emerged on the eastern end of the Fertile Crescent, in the Tigris-Euphrates River valleys, in what is now the country of Iraq. We're going to focus on the city of Uruk, one of the most important of these cities. Life in the southeastern portion of the Fertile Crescent was very different than life in Chateau Hoyuk or in Jericho. The southeastern Tigris and Euphrates river valleys are very flat and marshy. 
They don't receive very much rain or precipitation, but there is plenty of groundwater. The people in these regions would have had to work together to practice agriculture. They would have had to have built canals to water their fields and to control flooding. The people working together would have also been able to build cities. The people of the Southeast Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia came together to build the first cities in the world. These people would eventually be known as the Sumerians, although they probably called themselves the black-haired or black-headed people. We're going to focus on one of the most important cities they built called Uruk. In their cities, the Sumerians built monumental public structures, especially temples and palaces and government buildings atop the tells. These tells would grow taller with time as old buildings collapsed and new buildings replaced them. In the center of this image, you can see a couple of tells around the city site of Uruk. Scholars and scientists think that these tells with temples on top evolved the ziggurats constructed by later Mesopotamian civilizations like the Babylonians with whom the ancient Greeks came into contact. These expanding tell temples may also have been the basis for religious stories like the Tower of Babel. On the right of this slide is a reconstruction of the White Temple, a religious edifice where the Sumerians of Uruk worship the sky god Anu. On the left of this slide is a piece of the pediment of the temple of Inanna, the daughter of Anu. Inanna was the goddess of fertility, sex, and warfare. Quite a combination. Inanna may have inspired future deities like the goddess Ishtar of the Babylonians and the goddesses Artemis and Aphrodite of the Greeks. The Sumerian cities were ruled independently, much like the city-states we would see in the Greek civilization millennia later. Each of these cities was ruled by a king. The kings were ambassadors between the gods and the people. The kings claimed that they ruled on behalf of the gods to justify their hegemony. The kings would have collected resources from the countryside. Some of these resources would be given to the priests. The rest of the resources would be used to support administrators, the military, and artisans. Here is an image of the mask of a woman. Some think it's a mask of a nana. Here is the Uruk vase, depicting Sumerian people bringing agricultural produce, namely livestock, to their kings and priests. Now that we've discussed the government and religious authorities of Uruk, we can discuss daily life for everyday residents of Uruk. Everyday Sumerians would bring goods to the king and his priests. They would also dig canals, which could be traversed using boats. Women in Sumerian society wore wraparound robes that, and they kept their hair long. Men also wore long hair and kept square beards, but men wore cloth kilts that kept their chests bare. Priests, like seen in this left image, who are usually male as well, also wore kilts but they shaved their heads and faces to distinguish themselves from secular men. Here are some modern artists' recreations of how the Sumerians may have looked as they went about their daily lives. The Sumerians frequently wore jewelry, highlighting their culture's full adoption of metallurgy, of gold and silver and copper primarily. Priests, shown at left, kept records of goods donated to the gods 
and given to the king, giving a rise to the administrative branch of the Uruk government. Now we can discuss some of the Sumerians' technological innovations. As mentioned on a previous slide, the Sumerians practiced extensive writing, something that Jericho and Shatahuyuk did not do. They developed a written language called cuneiform, meaning wedge-shaped. Cuneiform was a writing language that contained both pictograms, similar to hieroglyphics, as well as syllabic symbols, but the cuneiform writing system would become more syllabic over time. Cuneiform evolved from recordings used to keep track of resources. Most cuneiform that we have found as archaeologists was written on clay tablets and was not meant to be saved. There are usually records of resources, shopping lists, things of this nature. Literary works would not be written till later. Some cuneiform tablets would also describe historical or religious themes, and these were meant to be preserved, but they were not large-scale literary works. The Sumerians also developed the wheel, which allowed goods to be more easily transported to the cities. Pottery wheels also allowed ceramics, used primarily for food storage, to be made far more cheaply and easily as well. In addition to developing the world's first monumental architecture, the temples built on tells, the Sumerians also developed the corbel arch, seen here, made from mud bricks. This is an example from the entrance of the tombs of Ur. Here are some diagrams that illustrate the evolution of cuneiform as well as the development of the corbel arch. As you can see on the left, the cuneiform writing system evolved from pictographs, becoming more wedge-shaped over time. You can also see the corbel arch and its differences with a true arch developed by later cultures, but perfected by the Romans. The corbel arch's top bricks are parallel with the ground, as seen here. Whereas a true arch, its bricks are circular. Unlike the Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk residents, the Sumerians exhibited elements of social stratification in their burial rituals. If you remember, the people of Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk placed the remains of their dead in their homes. The Sumerians, however, built elaborate tombs for their wealthy people. These tombs were built in specialized complexes and cemeteries, usually outside of the cities. The Sumerians' choice to build large tombs, as seen at sites of the tombs of Ur, shown here, reflect the stratified values of Sumerian society. The Sumerians believed their kings needed possessions for use in the afterlife, suggesting that they believed, one, in a life after death, and two, that a deceased person could bring possessions with them into the afterlife. The Sumerians also practiced human sacrifice, killing and burying soldiers and servants in these tombs, suggesting that the kings would need service and protection even in death. It is unclear whether these sacrificial victims went to their deaths willingly, hoping to serve their king, or by force. The Sumerian city-states, including Uruk, lost their independence circa 2350 BCE after being conquered by Sargon I, king of Akkad, who ruled them under the Akkadian Empire. By this point, Uruk had lost much of its prominence as a Sumerian city. 
Sargon's military effectiveness may have been due to his army's adoption of new weapons, like war chariots, seen at the bottom of this slide. As well as bronze weapons, seen at the top of this slide. Bronze, an alloy of copper and tin, is much harder than plain copper, although it is still softer than iron. The exploits of King Sargon, who created the world's first empire, may have inspired fictional stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh, developed between 2100 and 1200 BCE. By the time of Sargon, Uruk was no longer the most prominent Sumerian city, as I mentioned before. Nonetheless, Uruk as an urban center would persist for millennia after Sargon and the fall of the Akkadian Empire, only being destroyed in the year 700 CE. We've covered a lot of material in this lecture video, so let's briefly recap things before we close. The first settlements slash civilizations in the ancient Near East slash Fertile Crescent region developed after the adoption of agriculture at the end of the Neolithic period. These settlements, Jericho and Chateau Hoyuk, bore some of the elements of cities, but they did not possess all 10 of the parameters identified by V. Gordon Child. The first cities, by Child's definition, emerged to the south and east of these settlements in southeast Mesopotamia. These cities included Uruk, which was one of the most important of these early urban centers. Uruk possessed all 10 of child's parameters for defining a city. Uruk had resource surpluses, clear social stratification, division of labor, government, religion, written language, technological developments, and monumental architecture. Uruk's religious structures, temples built on tells, would evolve into the ziggurats of later civilizations. The Sumerians developed new technologies like cuneiform writing and corbel arches, which allowed them to keep track of their resources and build larger, more impressive monumental architecture. Later civilizations, like the Akkadians, would expand the Sumerian cities and would establish new urban centers and empires in the ancient Near East, some of which would become important trading partners and military rivals of the classical Greek and Roman civilizations to the Northwest, which will be the primary focus of this course.